come and talk at Tafak. It's a number of years since I had the excuse to come here. And the excuse really stems from one of the things I love most about working in a museum. It's when pictures like this appear in your inbox. And uh, we found this at the weekend. Is it anything interesting? <laughs> oh yes, it's interesting. Um, this came from a metal detecting rally in 2016 now, um, at Dersey, just east of Cooper in the northeast of Fife. Um, found in a rally with about 100 folk there, but the first finds were made by a schoolboy, David Hall, with the cheapest metal detector at the rally, something I quite, I quite liked. These are fragments of Roman silver. We can tell from the style, from the decoration, from the quality of silver, that it was the Romans we were dealing with. And yet this isn't really a talk about the Romans. At least not the Romans as you see them here. Because this is not to do with the Roman army. It's to do instead with the relationship, the impact the Romans have on the populations of Scotland, the ways they deal with groups beyond their frontier. And to set Dersey into context, I'd like to show you a bigger picture. A picture that starts with the question of the Roman occupation of this part of the country. For if you look at the standard maps of Roman Scotland on the left in the late 1st century, on the right in the middle of the 2nd century, there's a gap. Fife and the Lothians see no permanent Roman occupation. There is the odd temporary incursion, but there's no permanent force known. And given that these are good barley lands, these are classic aerial photography and terrain, I think we have to treat these maps as significant. The Romans did not feel the need to put a military presence into Fife, the Fife Peninsula or into the Lothians. This is not a new argument, but the maps make the point quite strong. These were, if you like, friends of Rome, client kingdoms. Not like these nasty souls across the Tay in Perth and Angus who require a heavy military presence to keep the lid on them. And what you're seeing, I think, is different Roman reactions to different tribal politics. When the Romans come into an area, you have a variety of choices. Do you fight? Do you flee? Do you, do you run? Do you deal? And different groups, different tribes are making different decisions. And the groups in Fife and the Lothians saw the possibilities, not just the threat of the Roman world. Because Rome wasn't just a threat, it could be an opportunity. You look at the wide variety of Roman finds coming up mainly from metal detecting from Fife, brooches and coins, particularly brooches. And these were things you could wear as status symbols, wear to show off. Something you could use locally as a way to show your connections. So in the first and second centuries, while other parts of Scotland see soldiers marching backwards and forwards regularly, it seems that the Fife Peninsula was not seeing that. They were getting Roman objects, but without the, um, the hobnailed boot of their own army. So that's the context, if you like. A world where some groups are friendly, or at least tolerant of their own role, and others are more hostile. What happens then towards the end of the second century? At this moment here, when the Antonine Wall is abandoned in the 160s, and the Romans pull back, effectively forever, onto Hadrian's Wall. They then have a problem. And that problem is how do you deal with these groups beyond the frontier? If you don't have the manpower to send the army in every time there's a problem, and manpower is a challenge at this time, how do you try to keep the lid on frontier politics? Well, this period here, the late second century after this is abandoned, the answer is silver. And we see a flood of Roman silver coming north. In the space of two generations, from the 160s to the very early 200s, we know of over 6,000 Roman silver coins from Scotland. 6,000. And that's just the tip of a silver iceberg. More hordes appear every couple of years. Silver is a new material. It's not something that the local population of it had access to before. So it's potentially an exotic and powerful thing, a thing to show off. And this particular silver has the very face of the Roman Emperor on it, a mark of the favour of Rome. And you'll see a strong targeting up the eastern seaboard, particularly eastern, eastern, eastern central Scotland, in the Lothians, Fife, Persian, and Angus. 
Now, humor me for the next thing, because one of the great things about coins is you can date them. We can tell what date a coin mode is deposited from the date of the latest coin. And we then start to play crazy games by looking at the dates of these hordes and seeing to change over time. So at the time when the wall is still occupied under Antoninus Pius, you see this fine beard on the right here, there's a scatter of hordes north and south of the wall, no particular patterns. The wall is abandoned, and suddenly a flood of silver comes in, and look at the focus. A really strong focus, the Lothian's Fife Persia. A real clustering of coins here. This is politics. This is chaos. This is giving silver gifts to friends or buying off enemies. The silver is pointing out the areas where the trouble spots are. And interestingly, you roll the clock forward to the next emperor, the distribution shifts north, up into Aberdeenshire and the Murray. The pride of the problem shifts or the politics changes. Maybe you try buying off the groups beyond the trouble spots as a way of creating strife within local society. And after the invasion of Severus, the last Roman to attempt a substantial invasion of Scotland, a total shift again, a shift south, south of the Tay, clustering in the east of Scotland. So you can then create maps like these, which show change over time, and the area where you always see silver hordes coming over two generations is Fife. The politics shifts, but Fife remains the focus. The question is, why is that? Well, the Roman sources are not always helpful, but because they don't like recording when there's problems. But here we see under Diocassius the Caledonians who joined the Maiatai in the vault. And this dates to the 190s. This is part of the, the picture of problems in the northern frontier of this time. Who are the Caledonians and who are the Maiatai? Well, we use the term Caledonians really loosely. As the Romans themselves did, we use it today to scatter it across Scotland. We are all Caledonians. And yet it seems likely, in the work of James Fraser in particular has argued this, that it refers originally to a particular tribe, a particular group. And the same in the Mayantan. We can see the trace of these tribes still in the landscape today. And we see it in place names. Dunkeld, the fort of the Caledonians. She howling the fairy hill of the Caledonians. The might fall to the Mayata, or Mayat hill. And these are some of the clues that locate the Mayata around the head of the fourth, and the Caledonians up into the Persian lines, foothills around there. You then realise Fife is the bulwark, Fife is the key area in facing these hostile groups. So perhaps we're starting to disentangle with a combination of archaeology, history and place names, something of the frontier politics of the late 2nd century. A time when silver, silver coinage, is the tool the Romans are using. A useless thing, you might think, in a world where you can't spend money. But these things aren't money. Oops. These things are not money. They're designed, as, they're used as prestige goods to show off of I have silver and you don't. I can get <coughs> silver. I can deal with silver. I can use this to seal alliances, to hire mercenaries, to give us gifts to the gods. These are prestige items in the late second century. So that's the setup for the Day of Sihor. A world of frontier politics, a world where the Romans are dealing in silver with groups beyond the frontier. Dare say it's different. No small circular things now. We're dealing with broken up pieces of Roman silver vessel. What is called haxel. These were once wonderful pieces of tableware chopped to pieces. And in this case chopped twice. First in antiquity and then by the farmer's plough over generations. So much of the fragmentation you see there is caused by year upon year generation upon generation of blood. Found in metal detecting and much of the find was scattered. Most of this had been absolutely dispersed. 
One of the great things was that we were able to get back onto that field within a couple of days of it being discovered. We were able to work with the metal detectorists who had been involved and find many more fragments. We would not have been led to this field otherwise. There was nothing known in the field before. It's just a normal barley park. You see it here after, after the harvest. Nothing known, no stray finds, nothing else recorded from aerial photography. Nothing to draw the archaeological eye. So the metal detecting in that sense drew our attention to a fascinating find spot. We go there to find things, but we also go to find out. And we were able to find many more fragments of silver. 200 had been found by the metal detecting. Another 200 came as we stripped away the plough soil and working with the detectorists, plotted where these finds were coming from to look at the scatter to work out the original find spot. 408 fragments. The devil's own jigsaw. And our conservators were tearing their hair out for hours and days and weeks trying to puzzle these things back together again. Looking at subtle variations in the colour, in the shape, in the surface and so on. Gradually piecing together fragment upon fragment to get back to the period 1800 years ago when these things went into the ground. To try to recover their original condition and also cleaning up the surfaces so they go from being something like this as it came out of the ground to something like this fit for display. This is not a quick process. I could never be a conservative. Don't have the patience. But the outcome of this is piecing together these 400 fragments into parts of only four vessels. One, two, three, four. Each of these starting life as prestige Roman tableware, ending it as fragments in a five feet. Let me talk you through each of these fragments. The first one is the hardest to understand, more colloquially as the brandy snap. Um, <laughs> what it represents is a big lump of, of silver. And what we have here is a partially melted silver vessel. It may be a piece that was in the course of recycling, and then rather than uh, melting it down for some reason, it was rolled up um, and, and saved as a weight of silver. The blistered surface there comes from the, the partial melting of the object. The edges of it have been melted in, in the hearth. We can't do much more than that beyond saying the composition from scientific analysis matches gold and silver. Let me move on. For we have more luck with this, the best preserved really of the vessels. Um, two quarters of a dish that was once about a foot, foot in, uh, just over a foot in diameter. One of them surviving as a folded up fragment here, the quarter is nearly intact. The other one heavily damaged by the plough. All we have surviving are these fragments here. But look at the detail of that thing. Absolutely beautiful decoration. Here we're seeing high quality late Roman art. A lovely engraved line within a circle, a scrolling wave pattern around the edge of it, and we were able, working with Alan Brady, to reconstruct the original pattern, which you can see here. Among other things, look at the, the lines, the leaves, and the bundles of grapes. And this would have sat in the middle of a dish looking something like that. I'll show you an example now in the British Museum from Chours in uh, northern France. Uh, rather than the swastika symbol, a good luck sign at the time, ours had that symbol there. With the beaded decoration, exactly the same as we had. Gracing a senatorial table in the 3rd century. The third vessel, again, was in fragments. Here we look at the underside of it, and your eye will catch the circle, the foot ring of the vessel, and these lines, if I turn the vessel over, on the inside of it you'll see engraving, 
and floating. Now what we have here is a fluted bowl, the kind of thing, you see it in reconstruction, that you'd use to wash your hands at a posh dinner party. Because you were eating with your fingers at the Roman table, you would have um, water available to wash your hands. But only part of the vessel is deposited. So in the first instance, it's chopped in the, the dish, chopped in half, chopped into quarters, but only two quarters were buried. Here it's chopped in half, then a third of each half is removed, I don't know what happens to that, the remainder is folded up like an envelope. So violence being meted out to these lovely silver vessels. The final vessel now looks the most fragmentary of all because it was really thin silver, and yet it was probably intact when it was buried, with almost the whole room surviving from this vessel. It's really hard, especially at the distance you are, to appreciate its original quality. So let's zoom in and look at a couple of the fragments in detail. And look at the repoussi decoration, hammered up from the rear, a vase with a foot and a neck and a handle, piled high with grapes with a vine scrolling out from it. And the same pattern here, a different style of vase, highly ornate, handles, piled high with grapes. These are representing the good life. These are representing something of the high status lifestyle of the folk who would be using this kind of vessel. And again, working with Alan Gray, we were able to reconstruct how this would have looked. A wreath of olive leaves are all over the top, and then roundels <coughs> and vases. On the opposite sides of the vessel, an archway, a doorway, perhaps representing a shrine or a temple or something like that. The reconstruction gives you some idea of how it once looked. These intact examples, again from the show of sport, show you what this drinking beaker would once have been like. And it's designed so you see the decoration as you drink from it. It's designed for the consumer, not the viewer. Now all the examples I've shown you, they all find parallels in hoards elsewhere, and we can date those hoards by the coins they include, and they show us our hoard dates to the late 3rd century, between 250 and 300. So after the denarius hoards are abandoned, after the policy of denarius hoards stops, we're seeing its replacement here, different forms of silver. So here's the hoarding horizon. And the next time we see silver, it's very different. In the picture I show on the right here is the finest example we have from Scotland, the great Traprain treasure. Again, Axel. But it dates rather later. It dates to around 400, 420. The Dersey Hoard is early, and that's significant. I'll come back to why in a minute. What is Axel? What happens to make these lovely Roman vessels turn into nasty fragments of junk? Well, proper Roman archaeologists. Study these kind of things, the fine, intact, shiny stuff. That's far too easy. That's far too boring. The fragments are much more interesting. And they're interesting because they've lived interesting lives. Now, for a long time, the interpretation of these things was really straightforward and far too simplistic. Who would possibly chop up lovely Roman silverware? This had to be the work of barbarians. Who else would something like that? These uncultured uncouth souls from north of the frontier. Um, I've always been a little worried about that, not just because I'm a barbarian myself, but there's other evidence, there's other things that point to other stories. And we're just coming to the end of a, a project to, to republish the great treasure from Capraean Law in time, I hope, cross fingers, for the centenary of its discovery next May. And one of the things we've done is look more widely at this question of Haxel. Where do you find Axel? Is it just a barbarian thing? No, it's not. The red dots are finds of Haxilver, the dashed line is the Roman frontier. Haxilver is found inside and outside the Roman Empire. It cannot be blamed on barbarians. And you then move from the map 
up to the objects, you start to look at the, the items themselves and you realise they're being chopped up rather carefully. If, these are, if this is the work of barbarians, they are obsessive compulsive barbarians. <laughs> as they are tremendously neat. They cut things into quarters. They cut them into hats. They cut them into sixths and then neatly trim the sixths into wee slices. This is not just a bearded man with an axe hitting a balance. There's a pattern behind this, and the pattern is seen also in the weights. When you start weighing these objects, you realise there's a system. Here from Walter Newton in Suffolk, one pound and two pounds. Here from Echt in the Netherlands, those wee fragments together weigh half a Roman pound. This is being done by people working in a Roman economy system is being done inside the empire. This is bullion. This is silver vessels being converted to bullion. At times of economic crisis, you turn your wealth into portable currency effectively. The value of these vessels is not the artwork, lovely as they are, it's the weight of silver. And just as today, at times of economic crisis, you see the price of gold and silver rise, so too in antiquity. When times are tough, silver is what you hold on to. But not silver coins. Because by this date, due to inflation, silver coins are worthless. They're like pieces of bronze with tin foil on them. That's why the Romans stopped sending them north, because no self-respecting barbarian would look at a silver coin in this state. This stuff is high purity, 95% silver. The Roman state controls vessels really tightly. And because of that, it maintains a bullion. So hack silver, in origin, is the archaeology of economic crisis inside the Roman world. So, why has it moved beyond the frontiers? This is the overall map of hack silver. But if you look at this map now, the red dots show you hordes that are dominated by hack silver. These are a frontier phenomenon. So hack silver is found throughout the Western Empire. Hordes of hack silver are mostly found beyond the frontier. Why is that? It is a way of dealing with barbarians. Either payoffs, the continuation of the policy of payoffs, the new version of the denarius hordes, to pay off these evil Picts who are emerging. You see on the left a 16th century vision of a Pict. Or to buy soldiers, to hire warriors, to pay mercenaries. The late Roman army is struggling. They need men. If you have a pulse and two legs and can hold a sword, they could recruit you into the army. And you find soldiers from outside the empire serving the Roman state or returning with Roman goods in their pocket. So one of the mechanisms for silver coming north is payoff, the equivalent of the denarius hordes. The other is military service, payment for services rendered. Can we tease any more out of well, it's a plausible story. I like to think it's a plausible story. But if you look at the contemporary context of the late Roman period, so after the Romans have left Scotland, they're down on the Adrian's Wall here, the Roman finds coming out of Scotland cluster strongly again on the eastern seaboard, particularly in this area here. We have our two hacks over course, from Prey and from Dersey. And we have other things as well. We objects can be big clues. And there's a recent find from King Capel near St Andrews, which looks like just an odd shaped bit of metal. It's a really interesting odd shaped bit of metal because it comes from one of these things. And these are a typical style of late Roman brooch that mark out people who have served the Roman state. Soldier, high ranking officials. Here you see one in use by the highest ranking general in the late Roman army wearing one of these crossbow brooches on his shoulder. Someday in Fife has served the Roman world, came back with a brooch on your shoulder. These things are really rare. They they're a fingerprint of the Roman military, of Roman military service at this time. So what I would suggest we're seeing is the creation of a buffer zone. Is Roman politics focusing on this area here, up the eastern seaboard, particularly the Tweed Valley, the Lothians and the Fife Peninsula?
peninsula. And the focus, I would argue, is against the groups that have been problematic for a long time. This area here, which may be where the groups the Romans come to call the Picts, are starting to cause problems. So yet again, Hacksilver is all about politics. Either buying soldiers or buying peace. It's all to do with the relationship between the Roman world trying to control the world on its doorstep. The reason they're saying it's so exciting is its date. Because it is the earliest evidence for this policy from anywhere in Europe. These fragments from a fight field are discoveries of international significance. So what do you do about Axel? What is the use of this stuff? It's raw material. And if we look at a site like Clatcher Craig or near Newborough, now sadly quarried away, from that there comes a silver ingot. If we look at the finds of the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, look at local styles of metalwork, and we start to see a lot of silver. In jewelry, in finger rings, in brooches, in pins. The gleam of silver would catch your eye and mark you out as somebody with access to this new status material. Silver was status. It seems actually to be more important than gold. We have no evidence of gold having anything like this significance at this time. Silver, not gold, was a prestige metal of choice because silver had the mark of the Roman world with it. It came from these connections to Rome. And they're careful with it. I show you finds here from Norris Law on the southern shore of Fife. Home, of course, to the great surviving fragment of the great hoard found in 1819, mostly melted down by dodgy silversmiths. The hoard has been studied recently by my colleagues Alice Blackwell and Martin Goldberg and they've got some really nice new information out of it. Too often people tend to focus on the prestige item but they've noticed how many of the fragments link together. Bits of a vessel perhaps, probably this down here. And the wee fragments are often the most significant ones. So we tend to get our eyes drawn into the really lovely pieces of decorative metalwork. The clue to the origin, though, as Robert Stevenson noted 50 years ago, comes from the smallest fragments. That fragment here has lettering on it from a late Roman spoon. So the wealth of picture silver in Norris Law, buried most likely in the 5th century, comes from the, from the Roman silver they're receiving. This is a vital raw material. So silver is status in the late Roman Iron Age and the early medieval period, relying on these gifts from Rome. But why does it end up in the ground? Well, I said we don't just want to find things when we go next but we want to find out as well. We try to chase off as many hoard find spots as we can because we always find a stone. Why are people burying this kind of in this case, we had a great chance, thanks to the support of the farmer, to do both geophysics and excavation. He used to test a Paula running up and down with a magnetometer, um, which showed a lovely picture of the underlying geology um, and a few field drains. What it did show is there's no sign of a settlement here. There are highlighted there a few individual features, but there's no hint of any settlement in that field. The marks you're seeing there are the underlying geology. So we had to resort to old fashioned techniques of digging holes. And we stripped a big area around about the fine spots and there was archaeology there. But not the archaeology of the settlement, much as the geophysics said. Far more interesting. A series of pits, stones poking through with the <coughs> remains of two stumps of two broken standing stones associated with Bronze Age pottery. So this point where the hoard came from had been marked by standing stones, destroyed in the agricultural improvements, but originally standing in this landscape as a focus, a, a sign, a, a, a monument that would have attracted stories and myths and legends. Already 2,000 years old by the time the hoard was buried. And on the far side of the hoard, the hoard was found there, the black area, Perhaps a spring, 
a small, effectively um, wet area. These are like wishing wells of prehistory. Damp spots are areas where people seem to believe they could contact the gods. Much like we were hearing earlier um, from Steve's talk, the significance of water in belief. This is something that has run and run and run through the millennium. So many of our finest finds come from peat bogs or log edges, offered as sacrifices to unknown gods. And that, I would suggest, is what we're seeing here. This is not just any old place to bury your valuable silver. You have on one side of it two standing stones, and on the other, a peat bog. This was a special place. Probably a sacred place, certainly a memorable place. A place perhaps to put your silver under the protection of the gods, a place to offer it to the gods. Now, this may sound like archaeological crazy thinking. Has Hunter gone absolutely mad? No. Well, I would argue not. I, I, I would say that. Um, because we see it again and again things coming out of wet places, things coming out of older monuments. Norris Law, found on the edge of an older burial. Or here, Loch Lee. Now a drained version of its former self, but um, thanks to uh, Michael's wonderful uh, Loch Lee re evaluation process, restoring the former shape of Loch Lee, and recent better detecting shows a scatter, a very extensive scatter of finds out, particularly its eastern edge, of intact Roman brooches, and then also find one of these denarii stones. You, be, you might lose a single intact brooch. To lose half a dozen is getting distinctly careless. And it looks more likely that these are offerings of valuable objects on the edge of this watertight place. So the detecting is leading us into a story. And another aspect of that story comes from another recent find from Cape Old Ray, just south of Loch Beaver. Um, this Gemstone, that's about a centimetre tall, shows the Roman war god Mars with his spear and his shield. And then his hand is holding the goddess Victory. There's her wings. She's holding a stylized palm branch and a log to crown the victor. And that was set into a late Roman silver ring, which was just buried in a field. You then go to the history of Ochter Derden Parish, which to my shame I'd never looked at before, and you discover a reference to a hoard of Roman jewellery found in the 1880s. Now, parish histories are full of nonsense about Romans. Nobody had ever really believed this. Here we have a piece of Roman silver jewellery from the same place, found beside the deal stain, found beside an old standing stone, an ancient monument receiving an offering. Finds tell stories. Fragments like this from metal detecting chased up by archaeologists can tell us new things, can open new chapters in our understanding of Roman politics, of understanding of how locals, of how people here dealt with the Roman world, and of the opportunities that that led to. Not just a threat, but an opportunity, a source of silver. The raw material that becomes the power tool for the Picts for the next several hundred years. And from this metal detecting, our earliest evidence of a hack silver find from anywhere beyond the empire in the whole of Europe, the beginning of a new policy. These things matter. They help us to change the way we understand the relationships of Rome and its neighbours, the way that people in the Iron Age are dealing with. And Gavin asked um, in preparing these talks if we could mention a bit of the link into the search frameworks. Um, there is a national framework on the Roman presence. I was lucky enough to be one of the editors of it. Um, of course, I can tie bits of this into that story, but the problem of research frameworks is also serendipity. They need to allow for the totally unexpected. Because you don't want to constrain what you can think, because from left field can come something entirely unexpected. Or from left field can come a bright young student thinking of things we've never thought about before. So research frameworks are really useful, but they also need to have a flexibility inside them to allow for magnificent discoveries like the Dairy Award. You can still see the board on display, it's a national tour at the moment. It'll 
in, a, in Bath, in Duff House. If that's too far to go, you can still buy the book on discount. <laughs> Thank you very much.